Sir Andrew Bergerac is the story of Sir Andrew Bergerac, and he's a he's a glorious, intoxicating, improbable, epic hero. Um, he's a marvelous poet. He's brave. He's romantic, and he's also got the largest nose in France. It's an epic sweep of a of a love story and a tragedy. We came up with the idea of um, it being um, a gymnasium. Um, and being able to use a gymnasium or school gymnasium um, in different ways, lots of different ways. So we would have um, sort of a badminton lesson going on, but also there's choir practice happening at the same time. Um, and I think that influenced me to sort of be inspired by um, sort of gym practice and the aesthetic of a gym. It's going to be quite physical, quite musical. Um, you know, it's a space that you can run and dance and jump and shout in um, and trying to let the play have this uh, yeah this kind of reckless energy to it that uh, that sweeps through you know it's a, it's a huge story in in five acts it goes over 20 years um, and trying to find a, a space that uh, all of that can be imagined inside of and the language of the production is just exquisite um, it's that rare alchemy of poetry which is so accessible, so easy to hear, so direct, so dramatic, but also can just fly. Just as the Magna Carta has come to symbolise in our own time notions of independence from the tyranny of the ruling classes, so too the court of King John is etched in the imagination of the public as an example of weak leadership, political infighting and divided government. A play about power, politics, corruption. I think one of the interesting things about this play uh, for me is how it deals with power and whether power is held by the monarchy or by the state or by the church or by law and who should be above the law. They're interesting questions, especially in this um, general election year that we still should be asking ourselves. It's extraordinary and fascinating and dark and funny. Amazing play. And it's about political expediency and so-called just wars. It's about rulers behaving out of self-interest rather than for the common good. Familiar? I know there'll be a lot of singing. Um, we'll certainly make reference to the troubadour songs, French troubadour songs, which uh, were current at the time of King John's reign. And it just seems so right that the church should be used for drama. Yes, it was built about 1100, uh, and it was built by Simon de Sonly, who was a Norman baron, Earl of Northampton, and he goes on the crusade, and that's why the name of the church is so significant, because he makes a journey to Jerusalem. When he gets there, like the others, we can imagine him kneeling in front of the Holy Sepulchre, the cave where Jesus' body was put, put after the crucifixion. And of course, the magnificent church built over it. And so when he gets back in thanksgiving for a, being to Jerusalem and seeing the sites, but also safe return, he builds this church. An early medieval world of politics, power struggles, unlikely alliances, and inheritance battles. And of course, this is a church that we suspect not only that King John and his court frequented, but also in many ways epitomizes the tensions that existed between the crown and Rome in that era. So, you know, you could really argue that King John charts Britain's first decade of modern political life. I have always been a big fan of Arthur Miller, and uh, about ten years ago, after I had uh, read Time Bends, which is uh, Arthur Miller's uh, autobiography, uh, I was very aware that he had written a screenplay called The Hook uh, in 1950, uh, and the film was never made. Uh, and I was very, really, I was intrigued about this for a while, uh, and so I thought I'd find out 
it wasn't it wasn't published. I thought I'd find the place, so I tracked it down to uh, uh, University of Austin, Texas, where they can have an archive of such scripts and uh, American literature. And sure enough, they had this copy of the hook, and they sent it to me. It was much easier than I thought it was going to be, and the arrived on my doorstep. Patrick then shared this extraordinary, unfinished, typewritten script of Miller's play for the screen with me along with photocopies of some of Arthur Miller's accompanying handwritten notes. Over several years since, I've sought out other archived copies and complemented these with directions and extracts from further notes, as well as other sources gathered from various archives, libraries and universities, and through talking to a number of Miller's close collaborators. Altogether, hundreds of pages of photocopied scripts and notes have formed the basis of a transcript that Ron Hutchinson has since adapted for the stage, and which we're thrilled Arthur Miller's Trust have allowed us to premiere to mark the centenary of his birth. I think somebody in the Coventry Library System messed up, because I spent part of my teens there, and one day I was short of something to read, and I found this collection of American plays that nobody looked at. And I picked up two by a guy called Arthur Miller, View from the Bridge, All My Sons, I remember. And I read the speeches in them. A couple of speeches actually made my head swim. I felt dizzy because the power of that language was, was extraordinary. And I think I realized that working class speech could be poetic and lyrical and strong. And I think what Miller does, he allowed tough guys to actually speak emotionally. What Miller, I think, started out to write was a tract about the corruption and the violence in the docks in Brooklyn. Uh, and I, he couldn't help himself but actually start making human beings out of what might have been in a lesser writer's hands, stick figures. Because every single character has good point and a bad point. There's a point beyond which they cannot go in their desire to do good and the point beyond which they will only go with extreme reluctance to do harm. So there are all strong men, all flawed men, and that kind of attracts me because the writing means you can never let the character off the hook. feels that there is a volcano inside him that's going to blow one day and it's going to destroy him and it's going to destroy his family and the wife he loves and his children. But you see in this play a man struggling with the rage, the pain, the confusion of a, of a simple working man. Why is everything screwed up? Who's going to fix it if I don't fix it? But fixing it means lighting the blue touch paper to that violence which he knows is buried not that far under the surface in him. And I think that's what drew me to the project and what will keep an audience, I hope, on the edge of their seats. It's early days, however, what we really would like to do uh, is put the story into, in, in, into the pier, into the docks, into, into Red Hook, which is this area of Brooklyn. So, uh, the question of work, what longshoremen actually do, is really central to the design. We have been trying for the last three years to acquire the rights to this novel and were finally successful last year. Brave New World asks big questions about society and the question that I'm most interested in is, is it better to have the freedom to be unhappy or to live happy and content but a slave? Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World in 1932 and he was incredibly prescient when he looked forward to society to see how he thought we might be living and the things that he's writing about, the questions that he's asking are just as relevant now as they were then. In fact, possibly more relevant. He's writing about the things that we do with our time, the distractions that we have to stop us from feeling bad about our lives. He's writing about sport, sex, drugs, pleasure, and he's asking huge questions about freedom. Gaslight is a Victorian thriller written in 
1938 by Patrick Hamilton. Uh, he also wrote Roke. It's a Victorian thriller with a difference because it's written incredibly brilliantly, truthfully, and with enormous psychological depth. It's, uh, it's a piece of terror. It creeps under your skin. It's the most, I don't know how he does it, but within three lines of the play, you are filled with a sense of deep concern, which becomes very quickly a kind of cold fear. But it's a very, very clever piece. It's centrally about a marriage, um, about a husband who abuses his wife subtly and horribly by a form of psychological torture. In fact, the word gaslight, it became the word gaslighting, which I think is amazing. So gaslighting means this kind of abuse on someone where you try and make them think that, that their memory lapses are actually about losing their mind. And so gradually, very gradually, the man, Jack Manningham, is trying to drive his wife, Bella, mad. I've always been attracted to thrillers, I think, um, throughout my directing career. Um, I directed Post Mordings twice, Don't Look Now, Dial M for Murder, and uh, I think in all cases something that pulls me is, a, is, the, is the kind of dirt, the darkness, the, the deep pool beneath the writing that there's always a surface tension, but beneath that it's exploring something almost unspeakable and creeps and emerges throughout the piece. And that's, that, I think, is why I'm also drawn to Gaslight. Um, on the surface, it's a brilliant thriller, but there's something more disturbing about it that is sort of unnameable. So Herbal Bed is a play by Peter Whelan, um, originally produced by the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, it's a play based on the real-life story of Susanna Hall. Susanna Hall was Shakespeare's daughter and she was accused of adultery. The Herbal Bed is a study in the tension between our public and our private lives that is written with enormous warmth, wisdom, humour and tragedy. I have adapted The Snow Queen for the stage. When I say adapted, I mean taken terrible liberties with, really. Um, the Snow Queen is a quest story, but it's a quest with a difference. Along the way, our heroine Gerda meets a raven who can talk and rap. She meets a prince and princess who you might recognise from another fairy story, but I think you'll be seeing them in a different light. Anyway, there are twists and turns and danger and drama and ballads and raps and duets and jigs and lots and lots of jokes. And of course, some snow. <coughs> <laughs> the show is actor muso, so all of the actors on stage play uh, everything that you hear. They play uh, guitars, pianos, uh, lots of fun pieces of percussion. Um, so the show's got a real uh, sense of fun and kind of anarchy about it, um, and whereas also all the characters can be doing nothing and then suddenly they can just burst into song uh, and there's loads of energy and craziness on stage. So it's basically a really fun, high energy uh, comedic show uh, and uh, I think audiences of all ages will really enjoy it. I was interested in directing The Snow Queen because it has two really feisty women at its heart. Um, I've got a little boy and it's so I feel really invested in making theatre for families and it's a real privilege to be able to, to make some great quality family theatre because that's what I want for him to experience. So our final production of our Young Company season is the new play in which Theatre Royal Plymouth, West Yorkshire Playhouse and ourselves, Roland Durngate, have co-commissioned uh, Deepo Agabalaje to write a brand, brand new play for young people between the ages of 14 and 21. What's been most interesting about this project has been doing the workshops with the young people, getting to know their thoughts on what it means to be a young person living in 21st century Britain and also their thoughts on what theatre means to them. It's been, that's been the highlight of uh, writing this play. 